Yeah. Excellent. Cool. Okay, do you want to read the intro? You go ahead. Okay. This is Burn This Book, a banned books book club where we, Nicole and Eden, read a banned or challenged book twice a month and discuss its meaning, impact, and censorship to make it more accessible for all readers. This week's book is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, which was published in 1937. This book has been challenged for three decades since the ALA has been banning book or not banning. <laughs> Since the ALA has been tracking bans and challenges <laughs> in the 90s. Today we have Christy Thomas. Shoot. <laughs> do you want to redo that? Yeah. Did you get nervous? I did get nervous. <laughs> okay. It was, yeah, okay. Today joining us... Well, okay. Joining us today is Christy Thomas. Christy, why don't you tell us about yourself? Okay. Um, well, I am an English teacher in... The state of Washington. I've taught in Idaho and Washington. I have my Bachelor of Arts in English with an emphasis in literature from Boise State. My master's in education um, emphasis in literacy, so teaching how to read from Eastern Washington University. I've been teaching for 17 years at the high school level, specifically English, and teaching 10th graders, 11th graders, AP English Language and Composition seniors, and a sci-fi fantasy course that was one of my favorites. Um, I'm also a writer, so I have that perspective. I've written my own trilogy of books, Young Adult on Amazon, um, and I've had a couple short stories published in some anthologies, so I kind of take both perspectives on uh, this book and teaching it. I've taught it many years um, to 10th graders primarily. So it's one of my favorites to tackle in the classroom. Oh, so cool. Yeah. Also, cool. can we plug your trilogy and get the link to the am- to it on Amazon for us to put in the show notes and in our social sure. media posts? Sure. Cool. Can do. Yeah. Love it. We, I need, I need we'd more, love that. I need more press too. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're here. Um, <laughs> so first, let's start with a summary of what this book is about. And... Um, I'll just do my version of the summary. It's going to be, so it's going to be weak, but you guys fill in. So there's this man, these two men, George, Lenny, they're these like sweet codependent friends. And um, George is a smaller guy and he's kind of the leader of the pack. Um, He kind of, it feels like he has kind of got like a savior complex. (laughs) He's really trying to take care of everybody. Um, And Lenny is this really big, strong guy, doesn't know his own strength. And there's probably some developmental stuff going on there. Um, I'm not quite sure, but he doesn't quite understand um, everything that's happening or the impact of things that happens. And he can't really control his... um, what he does in moments of stress. And um, they are migrant workers in California, which is John Steinbeck's little, like, you know, his little his baby l- place where he just loves writing about everything that happens there. And, um, and they're migrant workers, and they're jumping from place to place. And the dream is that they can end up getting their own farm eventually. Um, they've had to move places because Lenny continues to not know his own strength and not understand how appropriate his actions are. He loves touching soft things. And he had, they initially had to move a place because he touched, he was like petting a, a little girl and it got misconstrued. And so they had to leave and because they thought he was going to kill some, like they thought that the people of that initial town were going to kill him. And then he ends up coming to this new place. There's this woman. He starts touching her, uh, petting her as well. She's very soft and he starts panicking and she ends up getting her neck broken and that's like the end of the book and so there's a lot that happens in between that there's like a lot of like (laughs) a lot of things are happening but it's basically you're watching george try to control lenny so that they can live this dream together and yeah and that might be a really really crass uh way of describing this book but those are the big points i took when i was in high school and i was like oh that was heavy and my reread was like way more deep and way more intense this time and I was like anxious almost the entire time because I knew how it was going to turn out and yeah I don't know how I feel about Lenny have you guys watched Killing Eve no you don't watch Killing Eve neither well for anyone listening who's watched Killing (laughs) Eve the Phoebe Waller Bridges thing Lenny is very villanelle to me where it's like villanelle doesn't want to kill everybody but she just like does she just can't help it (laughs) and it's like very stressful to me but it was also really beautiful, but does anyone have anything to add or bring into this? 
when I first read this, uh, I didn't read this as part of high school. I read it. Um, I was our flight was delayed to Hong Kong to visit family, and I was reading it. I read it in the time that our we sat down and waited for our flight to actually board, and by the time I reached the end, I was in tears, just sobbing, because um, a big part of it was essentially George puts down Lenny um, and he shoots him and kills him yeah to yep. be specific to yeah. be specific <laughs> to be direct about it <laughs> that's yeah. true yeah. But, um, and I just remember crying and sobbing and my mom woke up from her nap she's like it's okay like our flight will be here soon I'm like no 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 <laughs> you don't understand they loved each other and it's just like yeah it was just so impactful for me in that way and um, I didn't remember a lot of the details reading it again this time around um but this time around i just like picked up on themes that i didn't pick on pick up on when i was a teenager yeah i didn't even think i don't think the girl in the book i don't think she has a name and i never yeah, realized that until curly's this time. wife yeah curly's mm-hmm. wife and christy said this in like her email to us when we were talking about doing this she's like it covers all the ism- isms and i was like does it and then i was like yes it does classism racism sexism um disability ageism. Uh, what is ageism ableism. oh ableism. yeah ageism yeah. ableism Racism. every <laughs> single thing yeah every single thing is in this little ranch that they're working at and it was like it's crazy okay christy what would you like to add to those kind of chaotic explanations <laughs> Um, Well, just some things that I, it does lend itself really well to multiple reads. And so going back and doing close readings is pivotal when teaching the book or reading the book. It's really helpful to go back and um, just notice the nuances to his writing. I don't know, stylistically, there's a lot of things that he does. Um, I love how beginning and end of chapters are tend, tend to be capstoned with description it starts the description of a scene, then it goes into the dialogue and action and ends usually with an end scene written like a play. And that's what he wanted to do with mm-hmm. it. And so that's something I point out to my students is this is why it's been made this great stage production and movie is because he intentionally wanted it to read like that. Um, and so I love the dialogue. It's so real, um, the language. And um, one of my favorite characters is Crooks. Um, He's the stable hand on the ranch that takes care of the horses and animals. And his chapter in the movie version gets cut, and it makes me angry every time. <laughs> because <laughs> What? Yeah, it's partially cut. They simplify his scene, and it gets rid of him talking about his childhood growing up in California and how his parents owned like a chicken farm, and he used to play with the white kids. And then his dad told him, it's not always going to be like this, and kind of warned him. Um, and he says, I understand it now. And um, to me, that's like shortchanging that big thematic idea of his experience and shortchanging him as a character. But yeah, so he's one of my favorites. And of course, the idea of do people outlive their youth? And that's a big theme that I like to talk about with the book and this idea of what makes a person useful in our society and how do we treat people that we don't consider useful and what he's critiquing with that. Oh my gosh. That's fascinating. Um, also, a uh, sidebar, <laughs> um, Crooks is African American. So if you haven't read the book, that would explain why there is differences. <laughs> um, and he, I think he's the only person of color in the whole book, right? Yeah, that's awesome. a big question that comes up. Ranch. Yeah, c- the kids get confused with that. It's a point I have to clarify with them because the descriptions of the guys is that they're of their um, like brown skin. Mm-hmm. And it's from working in the sun. Like, yeah. they don't, some of my students, um, that's the difference I noticed between teaching this in Idaho versus a much more diverse district in Washington. I'm in one of the most diverse districts in the nation. Mm-hmm. And my students here tend to not understand that. They, they're they like, they hear migrant worker and they go to certain stereotypes they have. And when they hear brown skin, migrant worker, they don't think white. And I'm like, well, for the time period, so there's a little less lesson you have to teach there about this. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Otherwise, they're not going to get that. Dy- it's it's going to confuse them when they get to that and understand it. I mean, they'll eventually pick up on it, but yeah. that's usually a question early on. Yeah, that's interesting. But the students in Idaho, did they understand that initially? Like, did they just assume everyone was white? Yeah, that's something you get when you have a very yeah. 
predominantly white population, and especially when you're reading a white writer, um, yeah. there is that assumption of whiteness. And so I think it was more of a given there that I, I didn't see that as much in Idaho. And yeah, I think that's just perception and experience. Yeah. There, you got a few so because you do have um, a lot of migrant workers in Idaho also that are yeah. Mexican especially. So, I mean, there was a little bit of that, but not nearly as much, I think, as I've experienced now. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's so interesting. Where, do you feel like the, um, the book overall is received differently in each in each school district or has like over time you've been teaching this for how many years have you been teaching this book? Um, so I've been teaching it probably the last 10 years at least. At yeah. least. Has I there didn't been any it. sort of change in how it's received by kids depending on like what's going on in their homes or political stuff or is it just like they're all receiving it the same way <laughs> they've always received um, it? They pick up on the themes but I think in Washington, I don't know if it's the Me Too movement or whatever, but a lot of the things with Curly's wife and the and the subtleties there on what's going on with her and her relationship with her husband and the controlling aspect of it and that unhealthy relationship, they pick up on that a little bit more mm-hmm. of how he's always looking for where she is. In Idaho, I had a lot more kids who were like, and I still get a little bit of it in Washington, of like blaming her. Mm-hmm. Um for a lot of the stuff and about how her marriage is like, why does she keep flirting with the guys? And I'm like, she's talking with them. What has she said that's, you know, inappropriate? And they're like, well, the way she, the way she carries her body. And I'm like, okay, so that means that if a woman moves her body a certain way that you can take that as an open invitation. (laughs) I mean, so we have good conversations about that and like how a woman dresses and criticisms that I have of people that assume things based on the way a woman dresses and so it I think over the years I've just seen that some of that political awareness has brought that in also with the issues of race um a lot of kids have questions because they don't quite understand a lot about histories of segregation and which areas Mm -hmm. where they have like a very um simple understanding of it as far as like regions of the country and Mm -hmm. how people are treated and not understanding how it was in California versus let's say the deep South. And mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. there's some of that you have to go over with them, but they get the basics at least. Yeah. That's yeah. the same. <laughs> Fascinating. Do you have any other questions for her before we keep going? I have so many questions, but I just want to, I want to, <laughs> I don't want to just be me like, Hey Christy. So na- now that, <laughs> yeah. well, that's kind of where I want to go. Yeah. Like, hey then Christy. Go ahead. Like, <laughs> can, well, you yeah, should, could you, you talk should guys to do what you think? I don't know. <laughs> then we're gonna I've go read for it. it. I've read it at least fifteen times, so I mean, at least I mean, probably twenty. So, yeah, yeah. I yeah. This time reading it, um, the the theme of loneliness really stuck mm-hmm. out. Stuck out. Well, stuck out. <laughs> stuck, out <laughs> stuck out to me. Like every single person in this book is super lonely from like Lenny and George to Curly's wife like Mm -hmm. no one talks to Curly's wife because they're afraid of Curly um and that like really struck me this time around of just like the loneliness of migrant work um and I guess a bit of the American dream as well Mm -hmm. like you're pursuing something that's been promised um but like the the road and the path to it is very lonely. Mm-hmm. Or and that like you might not even achieve it in the end either. Yeah, and yeah. that road's cut off for certain people because of what they're born into. Mm-hmm. And that that is important that so many characters have that in common with each other in the book. And yet they stay isolated from each other. They don't talk about that a whole lot. Except Crooks does. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Which is why he's one of my favorites, is he opens up to Lenny because he feels like it's safe to talk to him because he won't tell mm-hmm. anyone. <laughs> He'll forget. Yeah. And he just needs someone to talk to. And that that's so important to humans that and I talk about that with students is out of all the emotions that humans feel, is loneliness the most damaging? Hmm. And so we talk about, you know, what does loneliness lead to? You know? And that yeah. type of isolation and feeling like you don't have anybody. And what happens to your dreams when you don't have any, anyone to share it with? Yeah. That was interesting, too. It's like, so there were two things 
it was fascinating to me that um, George and Lenny kept like pass not passively but like indirectly inviting people into their fantasy of getting a farm. But that by the end, I was like, okay, now there's like four people jumping on this bandwagon. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, okay. Um, and that was really interesting to me because they were just like, ah, but we got to do it. And even Crooks was like, he, he, he offered to be part of it and then he redacted it after the fact, which was really interesting to me. And even after that whole conversation, you see Curly's wife come to the barn looking for Curly or... I don't know if she's looking for Curly. She's just looking for someone to talk to. And she gets mad at everybody because none of them are willing to talk to her or to each other. And she was like, what is it with you people? And she really calls them out and, like, really reflects all of their issues onto them. And they're just like, ah, oh, you're trouble. And, well, then yeah. she, she pulls the most horrific card of all, which is to threaten crooks with a lynching. Yeah, she's, that was terrifying. She says, I, I can do it in an instant because she knows. And that's one lens I use with kids is the idea of power and power hierarchies in the book. And how is she asserting her authority over him Mm. and how she knows to use that to her advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's why he retreats into himself. And then Mm. he goes back on the dream is because she's, I guess, put him in his place is, I mean, that's Mm. the way that you might categorize that. Mm -hmm. and reminded him that that dream isn't for him Mm -hmm. and so um that's one reason why some kids get to of course like not like her because at the one hand you can feel for her and feel sorry that she's so lonely that she lashes out but at the same time she says something so awful and you know treats another human being that way yeah she's a complex person she's I, I think we, sh- yeah, <laughs> I think on the good to evil side, she's probably, you know, racism is pretty evil and threatening to kill, to get someone killed and murdered. <laughs> it's pretty evil. But like, um, but it is interesting because every single character is very complex. I, except for, I can't tell about Curly though. Would you guys see Curly was multidimensional in this book or was he literally just this? I don't know. I don't know. Because he had the dad thing. He's got his whole dad issue where like his dad owns the ranch and he fears his dad and everyone kind of, he, his dad is kind of this like this this very invisible hand kind of working everything that when they're like oh when curly's hand gets broken lenny breaks curly's hand it's kind of an exciting moment stressful moment but <laughs> everybody, everybody like, oh. cheers for it yeah <laughs> yeah but then it's also like oh no revenge is happening um uh, but like the dad factor is still like in there, even though it's not that intense. But it's just that's a fascinating thing that I didn't think about. There are so many levels of power happening on this little ranch. Yeah, and it's interesting. The dad's only brought up early on when the guys first come to the ranch. I believe in chapter mm-hmm. two, because chapter one is when they're camping out before. Chapter two, they meet the boss, uh-huh. and they just call him the boss. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't even get a name either. Um, so it's almost <laughs> like he's this like ambiguous authority figure that's looming yeah. and all the kids ask like why doesn't he ever intervene like when all this is happening and his son with the hand and I'm like I don't know we could go really deep and try to say you know is he like that authority figure that doesn't really care mm-hmm. um, about the little guy and the everyday person you know yeah, if we he talk just about wants the job thing. done yeah and his son's supposed to take care of things but he's definitely not the prince of the ranch he's not the one the guys respect I think mm-hmm. Curly to me when we with all the students that have talked about it, is he's kind of, in a way, kind of a stereotype of the, we should talk about him having short man syndrome, because he's a little smaller, uh-huh. he's yeah. a boxer, he has a chip on yeah. his shoulder, he's the guy that picks fights, he knows that he'll pick a fight with a big guy, because whether he wins or loses, he wins, because yeah. if a big guy beats him up, then it's like, oh, that wasn't a fair fight, if he wins, then he's like, oh, yeah. look at me, I beat up the big guy, Yeah, and it's just so... <laughs> To me, it's like symbolic of this idea of pushing for the American dream. Like he represents that of some people that are born with such privilege yeah. that they're not going to lose no matter what they seem to do. They can be yeah. taking advantage of others and they just get away with it. Yeah. So, Ugh, Can we talk about the old man Candy? Was that his name? And yeah. his dog. The kids cry yes. so much about the dog. <laughs> So Candy's an old gentleman who also is a worker on this ranch. And he is, um, we meet him in the bunkhouse 
where George and Lenny are going to stay the night uh, while they're living there. And he has this old grungy dog. and It's like, um, but it's, he's, Candy loves him so much, but he smells bad. The dog does. And everyone wants him to just kill the dogs. It smells so bad. Um, and does anyone else want to take over from that? Candy's a sweetie pie. He reminds me of a lot of people at my grandpa's polka club (laughs) where I'm just like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. He's a little rough around the edges. He likes to spread the gossip. He's that guy. Yeah. He's a poster. He's he's, yeah. Let me tell you all the dirt (laughs) on everybody before you got here. And Uh he's also, he's also has one hand that he can't use. They call him crippled. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know that's an old term we don't use anymore, but that's what the term they use in the book. And so he got injured on the job though. And some kids miss that detail is that's why he has that position at the ranch. And he knows Mm. his time's ticking. He's like, I know I'm not going to be useful for much longer Mm -hmm. because he knows he's getting older. He knows he can't do what he used to be able to do. Plus he has this arm he can't really use. Um, And so I just think that's interesting that that's why he's desperate. He needs, he needs a family Mm -hmm. and he finds it in these guys and of course he's going to take all the money he got as like this settlement for Mm -hmm. his injury and put it toward Mm -hmm. their dream and I don't think the dream they had for George reading it so many times George didn't really believe the dream not until I didn't know if it was actually real if he just made it all up Mm -hmm. I think it's a bedtime story it's a story you tell a child or someone to calm them down Um, yeah he repeated it so many times and Lenny always asked for it it, I mean, yeah. it just to me, it's that wistfulness, you know, that thing you want, but you know, you're probably not ever going to get, but yeah. it brings mm-hmm. you peace. Yeah. The only moment I was like, is it real? Was when he was getting specific about like, well, this person, um, they have to give up the farm soon and they're going to offer this and yada. And he got really specific when Candy was asking him about it. But even then that could have easily been a lie. Like, I just didn't believe that this dream was actually a thing I felt like it was one of those things that him and Lenny just talked about like a bedtime story but just to keep them going Mm -hmm. just to keep them moving forward but um like there's got to be a purpose to us moving job to job suffering yeah in the California heat yeah but I don't yeah I don't know um and then Candy's dog um one of the other guys he has he has a dog who has puppies so they find it very reasonable to now finally kill Candy's dog so Candy can now raise one of those puppies and kind of trade in. And Candy doesn't end up killing his dog. He has someone else do it. I don't remember who did it. And it was, it was really sad. I can pop in there. <laughs> Thank um, you. I knew you would know. You're like on page 34 on the I know, no, I don't 1972 have to that well. I, I have it in front of me. Yeah. Um, so Carlson's the guy that kills the dog. He's like a secondary character. He's kind of Slim's right-hand man. Slim is the guy okay. that's the prince of the ranch is how Steinbeck describes him. He's like your quintessential cowboy. He's yeah, mm-hmm. chiseled jawed, hawk yeah. nose. Yeah, he's like, and he's ageless. He doesn't look super young. He doesn't look super old. He just <laughs> kind of middle-aged, good-looking guy. And that's the guy that, you know, Curly's wife flirts with a lot is Slim. Mm-hmm. And... Carlson's like his, like I said, kind of his right-hand man. He looks to Slim for approval on everything, just like most of the guys do. But Carlson's the Mm -hmm. big one that does not like the dog. He's the one constantly, like, in the chapters, mentioning how much it stinks. It's not any (laughs) use to anybody. Um, And so, to me, the dog is candy. I mean, it's clearly this message about what he's thinking and feeling and when he's crying yes he's crying about his dog but he's also crying about himself yeah Mm -hmm. yeah and even says that later yeah yeah he draws that and I think also we see that like once George had to kill Lenny it was like oh my gosh we just saw this with the dog like we we keep seeing these sacrifices and um and which one is more depressing both of them are really sad but it was interesting because I think I was more affected by the dog being shot than Lenny, because I was just like, okay, now George can move forward, which feels so heartless on my part, which is probably something I should write down and talk to my therapist about on Monday. But, <laughs> like, but it was interesting for me to be like, okay, I can have a little bit of relief, because also, Lenny just, Lenny stresses me out. I mean, he kills a woman just because he's shaking her so hard. He, like, doesn't know boundaries, and it really, um, yeah, I don't know. He reminded me of, like, a Robert Zemeckis character, 
like very someone in Back to the Future or someone in Forrest Gump or someone in what's that Marwin's world or City of Mar I don't know. I don't but know. Robert Zemeckis <laughs> loves like loves a very guileless character who has um who has some sort of like um intellectual disparity compared to their body and he loves them also having a, like a moment of sexual deviance <laughs> it's just it's very interesting and that's what this book just kept bringing me back to i was like did he read of mice and men and did he like was he like lenny yes yes this is a very much a character that would be in one of his movies um well yeah. going back to the dog thing that's a that's one that i talk with students about is just like that being an idea of the book um because when Lenny, before he kills Curly's wife, he's in the barn crying over his dead puppy that he yeah. just killed. Yeah. And um, the attitude when the puppy dies, um, Curly's wife says, it's just a mutt. You can just get another one. And mm-hmm. we saw that happen with Candy's dog. And I always mm-hmm. pose to kids. And I'm like, is she just a dog? Mm-hmm. Is she just replaceable? She's a possession of Curly. She doesn't have a name. Absolutely. Yeah, she doesn't have a name. So in a way, is she saying that about herself? And then, I mean, I don't think she consciously understands she's yeah. replaceable. But I think that's an idea Steinbeck is playing with, is this idea of replaceability of people. Mm. Absolutely. That's something I should interrogate with myself, is why do I find her more replaceable than Curly's talk? I mean, than Candy's talk? <laughs> <laughs> Where is that? In, is there some internalized sexism? Or is it just I, don't, I want that... Um, I want that that conflict to just end because it gives me so much stress. <laughs> I don't know. But either way, it's still like the the outcome is still not very healthy for, you know. It's very interesting. It is. I don't know. But I'll dig into that later with Lori. <laughs> what were you going to say, Eden? Oh, I think for, for me it was the conflict of just like, okay, okay. Like I can like breathe now. Like I can. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels terrible to say, but it, it's just like. We both have anxiety, also. Yeah, that's that's something <laughs> we to both point have out. Anxiety medication. <laughs> <laughs> so the whole time you point... just had a constant anxiety. <laughs> like, yeah, oh, just kill them all, just kill like... them all. <laughs> no, not at all. But go on, Eden. Oh, one thing with um, with uh, Candy, I wrote this quote down because it really stuck out. Mm. Stuck out to me. Gosh, I keep saying stuck. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Oh man. <laughs> Okay, he says, should have shot my dog instead of let a stranger do it. Which I thought was really poignant and kind of points to, like, at the end of the book, it is a manhunt for uh, Lenny. And, everyone, like, the wrong people have guns. Uh, and uh, George is the one who finally pulls the trigger. And it feels like a callback to Candy mm-hmm. of just, like, oh, like, yeah, I will do this more kindly I will, I will end this for him. Yeah. Well, because the alternative is letting Curly get to him. Yep. And that's terrifying. And I'm sure there are also other alternatives, but like, it was supposed to be like the merciful act. But even then, Lenny is still in the same boat as an as a pet, as like a you know he's still not a person with dignity in the same way that Curly's wife is in this death too, because um, they're still like trying to control and take take care of the alternative is going to be worse for this person. I have to do this. Um, they don't get like any autonomy or any, there's no self-actualization for any of these humans for Lenny. I mean, yeah, for Lenny or Curly's wife, it's all kind of dictated by the man they're with the shorter man they're with. (laughs) (laughs) How tall was Steinbeck? (laughs) Interesting. Interesting. Steinbeck's like, this has nothing to do with me. (laughs) I'm from from New York. No. What's interesting is the book was first called uh, Something Happened, which is, like, to me, a horrible title. It's such a terrible <laughs> title. <laughs> it's so stupid. It's like, yeah. put, that, put that on any book. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stuff happens. Yeah. That's, but his point was, like, in life, stuff happens. Like, yeah. Yeah. sometimes things aren't, like, I don't know, like, they just things get set in motion, and that's mm-hmm. life. And you sometimes have mm-hmm. to just accept it and make decisions and, you know, what other choices did they have? What other mm-hmm. choice did George have? There were no mm-hmm. facilities for Lenny. Um, no. George felt a responsibility for him after Lenny's aunt mm-hmm. died. He had no other family. And 
George isn't family. He's just a guy that mm-hmm. bullied Lenny, actually. Told him to jump in the river, and Lenny did it, and Lenny almost drowned at one point. It was after that, George had this awakening and was like, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, guys like me are going to take advantage of him his whole life. Oh, and he changes yeah. and says, I'm going to be that person to care for him. And to me, that is like the beautiful part of it is like, you know, to take somebody that you are victimizing and stop and change. And, you know, George is a smart man um, throughout the book. He's thinking five steps ahead of everybody, um, not mm-hmm. just Lenny, <laughs> but he's, mm-hmm. but of everybody, yeah. he's, he's watching and weighing and that's what I really like about him, especially at the end, figuring out how to get a gun. He already knows as soon as he goes into the barn what he has to do, as soon as mm. he sees her body. And the other guys don't know except Slim. Slim's the only one that can see what really happened. The rest by the lie that there was some struggle over a gun that Lenny stole, and he overpowered this big guy and shot him, mm-hmm. execution style. I mean, that's just, I mean, it's weird to me they don't question it at all. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. They just accept the Wild it. West. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And, and to contrast that with the scene earlier that you mentioned between Curly's wife and Crooks of like, these are two uh, Curly's wife and George being in positions of power and then one choosing to uh, to extend charity and the other one to continue to demonize and threaten. And threaten. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. It's what's fascinating while you were talking and while you were just talking is like the names of everybody. The only people that have real names are George and Lenny. Everyone else has like these like Curly. I don't know if he was born Curly, but I'm guessing it's like a it's like a little like nickname or like the name goes by Slim. He has curly hair. Yeah, yeah. probably <laughs> yeah. seriously, and then Slim. Oh, he and does, Andy. and all of them. We talk about that too. It's like yeah, Slim is Slim. He is thin yeah. and tall. Yeah. Curly yeah. has curly hair. Candy. Yeah. The kids are like, well, why candy then? I'm like, I don't know. I think of my grandma that had those nasty candies in her house. Yeah. That were like, <laughs> I said, I don't know that one. It could be he's sweet old man. I don't know. I yeah. mean, yeah. I'm guessing he just had like weird teeth because he was, you know, he had a sweet Sweetie. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But although there's yeah, Carlson, gonna... there's Carlson and Wit. They're very minor characters. Um, Wit is a, the youngest one on the ranch and he's only in there for a little bit. Um, when they're in the bunkhouse, yeah, um, talking but those about those are still very magazine, much like, but yeah, like last name kind of energies too. Like we still don't. And what's crazy to me? So we read The Giver um, a couple months ago for this, and it was wild to see how quickly Lois Lowry was able to create exposition and like and give us so much background of these characters, but she didn't need to give us too much. John Steinbeck did the exact same thing in like probably about the same amount of pages, mm-hmm. where. We didn't need to know the family makeup of George. We didn't need to know all of those things, but we know she gave us enough information to know more about his soul that all those other things, like, we didn't know. I don't know if he's ever been married. <laughs> I don't know if he's, you know, like, but that wasn't important. And I think, like, but we, we really understood why he makes the choices he does and how his brain works. And he and John Steinbeck did that with every single character, no matter what their name was. And that was really crazy to me. So quickly, like so quickly, so much happened so fast, and it didn't feel like overwhelming for me. Like I didn't get confused. He's great with dialogue, um, and that's how that really comes through: is having good conversations between mm-hmm. characters, rich conversations. Mm-hmm. And to me, Slim is an important one that talks to George, and George reveals a lot of their past mm-hmm. to Slim because he's a confidant. Slim's a great listener, um, mm-hmm. and they even compare him, if I remember right, to like he. It was like to God. I think if I yeah. remember right, there's a passage. Yeah. And to me, it's, yeah, it's like this person everybody looks up to and he's supposed to save everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, but he, does he in the end is the big question, Slim. Well, he lets George go do his thing mm-hmm. I, and get away from the group and go take care mm-hmm. of Lenny. He understands George at the end and consoles him when the other guys mm-hmm. look at them and go, what's wrong with them? You know, like, Mm -hmm. they don't get it. Slim Mm -hmm. does. Um, So, yeah, I I think there's, it's through his dialogue. Because there's not Mm -hmm. a lot of narration as far as, like, backstory or Mm -hmm. flashback. I mean, it's, yeah, like, all interactions. Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah, that was wild. 
I was so amazed. Especially because, like, the last book I read of his was East of Eden, which is a lot of, a lot of descriptions. <laughs> Beautiful book, made me cry, was so good, but a lot of descriptions. I did my senior <laughs> thesis on that book. <laughs> oh my gosh, well, we're going to bring you back on here unless you're like this. It's been a long time since I read it. It's been 20 yeah, years okay. since I read it. <laughs> That's okay. You've done more research on it than we have, so. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, I didn't have um, I didn't have any other thoughts about this other than like the Robert Zemeckis thing really stuck out to me, but that's just because I'm always on a quest to like understand why this man makes the movies that he makes because they're so uncomfortable for me. Um, well, and I think that ties real quick ties to another thing I would share with kids is how influential this book is on our culture. I always show him the Looney Tunes clip of Bugs Bunny with the abominable snowman. And Mm -hmm. they are, once they see it, they're like, what? Because he goes in there and he calls Bugs Bunny George. He's, I love you and pet (laughs) you. And, and he then, and it's totally a riff off of Steinbeck. If you don't see it, it's like, come on, this is like, well, and Bugs Bunny's a bunny. They're slapping you. Right, and he says, I want my own little bunny. I will pet him and squeeze him. And he starts yeah. squeezing him like he's going to choke him out. I mean, it's... Yeah. And then I also yeah. share with them um, The Walking Dead. Um, I don't know if you guys know that show <laughs> very well. but there's <laughs> I know a... it. I've never watched it. It's too stressful. Oh, okay. Anybody remember? <laughs> I, I watched it up to a certain point, and then I yeah. kind of stopped. But I was a pretty big fan for a while. And there's a scene where one of the characters, Carol... Um, she's taken these two young girls under her arm, like almost like they're her own daughters because she lost her own daughter to the zombies. And the older daughter um, has gone really kind of crazy. She thinks that zombies, they're supposed to embrace them and take care of them and have like yeah. these relationships with them. And um, she ended up killing somebody um, as a result. And uh-huh. uh, her, own, her own sister, little sister, thinking it would help her move on to this next stage in Mm -hmm. development. She thought that zombies was like the next thing for humans. Mm -hmm. So there's this scene where Carol takes her outside and tells her to look at the flowers and Carol's standing behind her and she shoots her execution style and she's of course crying, but she's like talking to her like softly to keep her calm. And it's totally like George and Lenny where George is comforting Lenny at the end telling him the story of the ranch to keep him calm. Um, And when kids see that one, they're like, do you think they did it on purpose? And I'm like, I don't know, but the similarity is uncanny. I mean, she's like the innocent, just like Lenny, you know, she's, she's not able to continue living a full life without somebody. And the person that's their caretaker can realizes they can no longer control them. Yeah. Like it's beyond help. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's, so when you mention like other filmmakers being influenced, yeah, it's all it's all over the place. Once kids read the book, yeah, they pick up on it and go, "Oh, where else do we have these duos? Yeah, that one is supporting the other. The big guy supported by the little guy. I mean, I think that was around before Steinbeck, but he definitely helped define it even more. Yeah, because I think it was a mobster um, trope in like old movies, in early nineteen thirties movies too. Um, but also, like. Probably just because it was funny for mobster people. <laughs> so, probably, you know, they're like, oh, that's where we're bringing the comedy. You also um, have the comedy sketches the- like Abbott and Costello. Yeah. Um, where you have the, the thin guy, the fat yeah, guy. You know, guy. I mean, it's like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we love that. We love that kind of, um, that dynamic. Especially, like, even on cartoons, the evil people, there's always a thin guy and a real big guy. Mm. Pinky and the just, brain. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. Pinky and the brain. Yeah. Um. I have a question for Christy, unless you have a thought that goes on with this. Uh, no, my thought would be changing the subject. Oh, okay. This yeah. is my question. <laughs> um, what do you think is like the main thing you want your students to get out of this book? Why do you think it's important to teach this? Wow. <laughs> I think um, seeing how some of these problems that are that Steinbeck is toying with and pointing out are still issues we deal with today. They're a part of the legacy we deal with. And they need to understand, um, because I really do think the story is the story of America and the, the people that are ignored, um, which is the vast majority, and whether they like to think that or not. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I, I want them to get that. I want, you know, there's all the stylistic stuff that you can get from a book and just 
uh, the reading challenge that it has. It's not that hard of a book as far as the Lexile goes, the reading level. Mm -hmm. It's something you could hand to a, I guess if you really wanted to, an elementary school kid, but I never would. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But it's, it's, it's approachable and I, it's for them to think about layers of power in our Mm -hmm. system that exist and how they interact and Mm -hmm. seeing, do we still have that today? And Mm -hmm. that's one big question I have my students address is where do you see that around us or in your life? Mm -hmm. Um, And how do we deal with that? Because it's a tragedy in the book, of course, and we should see that, that that it doesn't end well really for anyone. I mean, some argue that George ends out well for him because he's absolved of responsibility, but it's like, no, he's lost his yeah, meaning in life. Companion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's just going to become like all the other workers. Just mm-hmm. go in, make your money, go to the whorehouse, go mm-hmm. waste it on booze, repeat, repeat, repeat mm-hmm. life without meaning. Um, so yeah, th- that's the big thing I want them to get. And um, I think some of the banning stuff, I don't know. There's two sides to it. I read a book by, it's over 20 years old now, by Diane Rabovich, who, mm-hmm. or Rabovich, I would say her name wrong, called The Language Police. And she goes mm-hmm. into censorship, censorship of and banning in schools, because she's an education expert, um, on the left and the right politically, and mm-hmm. how it's different for those two things. And she gets into like political, correct, political correctness on the one side. Mm-hmm. So I would say the criticism over, of course, some of the language as far as the N-word goes, Mm -hmm. some of the isms and the objectification and othering Mm -hmm. of people um, is on the one side, but on the other side is like the puritanical objections. (laughs) Um, So because of the language, because of the euthanasia or the murder at the end, however you want Mm -hmm. to word it, which is an interesting conversation right there to have. (laughs) Um, Mm -hmm. You know, is that justified? A lot of people focus on that a lot and are having kids argue that topic I don't like to focus on that as much. I like to focus more on the relationship and, you know, yeah, is it justified? But like, I don't know. I think that's, I think it's a kind of a stretch on that one to have a big, deep conversation about it. But Yeah, uh, I agree. I remember reading it in school and feeling really strongly that like, this was a really helpful book. Like this was a really good book and I loved it. And I'm like, had a, I have a visceral reaction about Lenny hug, like shaking that woman at, Curly's wife at the end but like I did it also in high school but it was also like one of the first books that I was like whoa whoa I have emotions from this this is big and I I think that is such like a powerful experience and I think especially people who are on the left side I do think we can get to that policing part where we're doing the same thing that um, people on the right side are doing and it is so risky because just because I'm having this it's like I was jazzed that I was having those thoughts and I was being forced to process things and I also am now being forced to process, like, why was I so relieved that she died? Why did that happen? Like, where is this sitting inside of me? And how is this affecting my relationship with other women who maybe are not likable to me, um, but are still being harmed and treated terribly and are in harm's way just because they are women? And have I othered her? Yes. Just like the men on the ranch have. I did. It, definitely and- in the book. Because I didn't want to be her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, and it's very easy to do. Like, I point that out yeah. to kids because a lot of them hate her and they just see her as the biggest problem. Just like, and I'm like, you're the guys on the ranch. Yeah. This, you've bought into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at it from her perspective. And, yeah. and so I think, yeah, there are some issues. I hate the word triggering because it's been so overused. But It has been so that. overused, yeah. Yeah, but it is that type of thing that I, it's hard because if you say anything about it, you're going to spoil that emotional reaction, right? And that, <laughs> you know, if you warn kids like, hey, this chapter has a scene mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. there's this. It's like, oh, there's only one woman on the ranch. I wonder who it is. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I try not to give warnings because I yeah. like that element of surprise. It's part of that experience as a group. And if we're going to read a whole class book together mm-hmm. and we're all going to work through it together, then... There is that element there that we all experience that. And I'm, I'm prepared for it as a teacher. That's the mm-hmm. difference. I would never yeah. tell a first-year teacher, hand them that book, not knowing the kids, not knowing the community, yeah. not knowing themselves well enough to handle it. Um, yeah. I didn't start teaching it until I was a, at least a few years into teaching. Yeah. And I had to be prepared for tough questions and, yeah. and, and, and 
involving the N-word as well. I mean, that's yeah. a big one. I don't say it, and I straight up tell my kids, I will not say it. I'll say all the other swear words because I don't care, but that yeah. word is ugly and it has a history, and you need to know how it was used so casually with people, yeah. so casually, and just thrown around. And, you know, I know that some parents object to it for that. They say my kid should never have to read that word or experience that word. And that that's tough. I don't have the answers to that um, as a middle age white woman. Um, that's yeah. not me to speak to that, but I do understand both sides to it that it's like, I did, I've never had a kid say the word. I tell them that's it's good. up to them, but to understand how that word can affect other people in the class. And I've, I've, I and other colleagues have had the classes vote on like a secret ballot, not open in front of everybody, but something where they felt safe to express how they feel on whether or not they felt it should be said. And if a single kid said they didn't want it said aloud, that was our class rule. Mm-hmm. And you're talking about in the happens. context of reading the book, reading the book or quoting it. Yeah. Aloud. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, if you do of, audio, just in the class. Yeah. yeah, no, 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 that's a, yeah. no, that's a different yeah. issue. Just in the book. And, yeah, yeah. you know, the audio versions have it. They say it. So that gets tough because then if yeah. you use that as a teaching tool, you're on that. But I've only had one kid ever say it, and that was actually last year, one of my 10th graders. Um, I do reader's theater with the book when we read mm-hmm. it aloud. Cute. I highlight the parts, and they each take a character on each chapter and they'd read the dialogue and I read all the narration and tags Mm -hmm. it's dialogue tags and that helps it come alive because I tell them it was meant to be a play let's read it like that let's do that so um she was reading one of the parts I can't remember which character um but it used the character used the n-word and she said it and everybody kind of gasped and looked and she's like what well she happens to be biracial and she's black and Asian yeah and she was like I don't have a problem saying it. I know I don't mean it. And I was like, well, it might make other people uncomfortable that you're saying it regardless of you owning it and saying it's okay for me. So it it was a good conversation though. And no, I had, I've never had a complaint in all Mm -hmm. my years, but maybe I'm just lucky. I don't know if it's the way I approach the book and teach it. I don't know if it's luck of the draw. (laughs) I doubt um, but it. I know I'm sure it's because you're being direct, though. Because mm-hmm. I feel like if if I was in a classroom where it was never directly like explained, and because um, I remember in high school, it, what like we had very direct, frank conversations, especially when we were reading the book Beloved, and I just remember that, and it was like such. It was the first time someone had a really direct conversation with me growing up in the white suburbs. Um, and my class, which was predominantly white, and I was like, oh, this makes sense. And it, I've never really been tempted by the N-word ever since, and I feel very uncomfortable with it, but it's because we had a direct conversation, and that came because we read a book. And I feel like there's a lot of people that miss out on that very frank conversation because there's not a good way to segue in, into it. There's not a very, like, natural way of segueing into that, con- into that, yeah, I don't know, for kids. Yeah, and it's tough because there's like, I always go with how deep should I go into the history of the word? You know, some yeah. years I thought, oh, there's this really cool video I saw that like uh, some very prominent black scholars have put out mm-hmm. going into the history that I found. And it's just so interesting to me as the English teacher into linguistics yeah. and all that, yeah. <laughs> that I'm like, I love histories of words and learning that and just not being ignorant about it. And so I understand the power that it has had and why that matters and and how it's changed and anyway so but I don't because I feel like it's I don't know that they're at that maturity level Mm -hmm. to um to appreciate I guess what's being said by these scholars and I don't want Mm -hmm. them to take anything out of context and then take that home and have it turn into something else so I kind of I do yeah Mm -hmm. that in between thing where you don't definitely don't Mm -hmm. ignore it you've got to step right into it yeah (laughs) yeah yeah there's other racial slurs as well um uses the j word i call it and that's against <laughs> japanese people that was yeah. used at the time period um yeah. that one was used once so i a lot of kids don't know that one and they yeah. think it's just casual like oh they're just shortening the word and i'm like no guys it's not yeah um so yeah there's opportunities for those conversations and be prepared <laughs> yeah <laughs> definitely should we go into why it was banned? Uh, sure. 
Yeah. Well, I have one more. One Ooh, more. Yes. Like, please, Eden. Please. Just like talking to you, Christy, and, and thinking about how like this book is a microcosm of America. It makes me think of the the people we have disposed of in society. And Lenny actually reminds me. So I volunteer as a casa, a court appointed special advocate. And the the girl whose case I have right now, she is developmentally eight years old but she's a big 15 year old yeah um and so like just having to do like going into the case knowing these things knowing like okay like i actually should be coming in with activities and like conversations that are more geared towards an eight-year-old's understanding than a 15-year-old's understanding um and it's very difficult for her placement family to basically have an eight-year-old tantrum in a 15-year-old body um so that's what i i yeah i just thought of her while we're talking about um lenny and Hmm. because she's had a very difficult life like she didn't have a placement family until she was uh 14 15 um she was given up uh, uh, several times throughout her whole childhood and just like just the disposability of her as a child um yeah just like makes me think of yeah the other people we dispose of in Mm -hmm. in society today well yeah and I think that's something a lot of students aren't I think they're truly ignorant of those populations even within their own schools Mm -hmm. that there are other students at their schools with developmental disabilities and they just don't know that with my kids like you you make those personal connections luckily i have that a little bit i have a couple of cousins who um, one developmentally disabled and one other that i lost during covid to and he had down syndrome but i lost Mm -hmm. him to covid and i bring up what it was like to be raised And those are my cousins and I play with them. And Mm -hmm. I said, I know that's not the experience everybody has, but you know, yes, the size of an adult, but yet the mind of someone much younger and the caretakers, and that is stressful. And I talk about Mm -hmm. even friends I have that have two developmentally disabled children. Um, And that there's plenty of joy and wonderful things that these people bring to your life Mm -hmm. and the fullness it brings, but it is, a forever job Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and helping them understand George's sacrifice. He sacrificed his freedom, independence, a future family probably Mm -hmm. for somebody else. And yeah, it's like other people would have disposed of him. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good reminder. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Christy. No, you go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think it's a good reminder. Just like the ranch, the ranch was not built for people like Candy and Lenny like it's it's a system that is not that it it's built for the healthiest and the youngest and the most able and i think about that a lot with just we've seen this also over the last 5 years our like the way businesses are run are not really built with working mothers in mind <laughs> they're not built with people with chronic illness in mind um they're not built with uh people who have completely different cultural backgrounds or religious um, obligations in mind and um, and when you are a person who has any of the the differences and you're stuck in the system it's really really hard to succeed and I think it's a really great opportunity to reimagine a ranch that could be safe for someone like Lenny Mm -hmm. or a ranch that could be safe for someone like Candy who's aging um, cause they, they did imagine a ranch that would like a farm that would be safe for them, that would be built for their needs and that they each had a job that would work with their bodies. Mm-hmm. And so uh, that's also like an interesting little thing. I think about that a lot as someone with like chronic illness and, um, just with how COVID worked out, like no one cared that I was on immunosuppressants. They were like, well then just stay mm-hmm. home. And it was like, okay, but I have a job. <laughs> tricky yeah it's just not built for people and even the school systems aren't built for like aren't tailored for people who have different abilities um and granted there's just not enough funding either (laughs) there's not enough resources or anything but well we 
we do have some of that stuff, but I mean, it's come a yeah. long way. It's taken, it's yeah. been a long fight, um, for students with special needs to have those needs met yeah. and to be, um, housed within a traditional school setting and not yeah. be sent to some other place. Yeah. Um, so that's really key that we, we have changed things, but yeah, I do still think that there's a lot of lack of awareness of that, but I do think Lenny, he does have value in his strength and it's like, yeah, is that the only true. value a person has and that they can produce? And once mm-hmm. they become more trouble than that is worth, again, they're disposable that, you know, mm-hmm. once you're too old to be productive, are you worth keeping around? And I think that aligns a lot with like Steinbeck's politics as well. You know, he was a staunch socialist and the anti-communist um, yeah. thinker of the time. And so I think he was, you know, he saw these farms. I mean, he, in Salinas Valley, yeah. he was going around and met these men and, and hung out with men just like this and yeah. seeing what they were going through, I think is key to remember and trying to capture them and, you know, really capture their lives and what it was like. Oh, it's such a good book. Quick read, quick read. Very quick. Um, okay, let's do, cause I don't want to take any more of your time, Christy. We've already taken an hour and 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> Oh my, I know. <laughs> um, but let's do the, um, let's go over why it was banned. My guess is um, violence, the N-word, and probably sexual innuendo or referencing of sexual things with Curly's vaseline hand in a glove for his wife. I missed that totally when I was in high school, like completely oh, over my head. I pointed out, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotcha. In fact, I, I, I do little centerpieces for the tables when I teach the book, and they're <laughs> themed for the book, and so I have like eight tables in my room, and on the table, I have a bottle of ketchup that I've made with a special label, it's fake ketchup, but I yeah. do a little label on it, yeah. it looks like it's from the time period, I do a can of ranch beans, Yeah. there's like this really cool brand at the store, um, and then I have a little tiny, tiny thing of Vaseline <laughs> on there, and... Oh gosh. The, so the kids funny. are like, "What is this about?" And I'm like, "You know what it's about." It's like but so sometimes it's so funny. <laughs> I won't explain all of it to them. I'll yeah. just say he keeps his hands soft for his wife. You decide what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're like literally for his wife, or it's like a stand-in for his wife. And I'm like, "What? what? Whatever." Oh, I didn't even think about the second one, but yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Well, because yeah. if their relationship is the way it is, I'm like, do you think he really is concerned about her needs? Yeah, that's a good <laughs> then, point, yeah. too. And yeah. then I leave it there, and I walk away. <laughs> and that's that's if kids want to, like, some kids like to talk about, or those are more side convos, not necessarily whole yeah. class. Depends if they bring it up. But when we talk yeah. about their relationship and how she wishes somebody would do something to Curly, and yeah. it's like, okay, so if he's keeping it soft for her, what is, that just seems kind of weird. Unless yeah. he's, you know, he perceives that he has a good relationship, possibly. Yeah. And yeah, That's, her perception is read. like, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Fascinating. Okay, why do you, you probably know why it's challenged or banned, Christy, but what are your guesses, if you don't know? Um, the aforementioned, and I would also say some of it is the, I think, stereotyping. Okay. Is how some people interpret it of all these characters are stere- are like dangerous stereotypes of people. Huh. Mm. I don't okay. think they are because I think they're representations of, like I said, yeah. those isms that are worth discussing. But I can see their point is that if in isolation you just look at each of these characters, you might say, yeah, they're just a stereotype of these things. And it's... Sure. But in the context of the 1930s when it was written, when no one else was writing about people in this situation, like, would it... Yeah. Well, especially lower class that. people. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'd be interesting. Interesting. Okay, Eden, what do you think before you read it? Um, yeah, the, the same as everyone else and uh, the, the poor animals as well. Oh, I didn't even think about the animals. Killing animals. Yeah, I got people with that. Yeah. And then, did you say the swearing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. On top of the racist language. Because I think those are like two things that you would see. Yeah. All right. Maybe even pro-socialist ideas. I'm just going to throw that in there. If somebody knows Steinbeck's background, they might object to any Steinbeck book because he's... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I don't... I think you're giving the people who are banning it too much credit, (laughs) to be honest. And that might sound so, like, so rude on my part. But honestly, from what I've learned is this... 
it there's not a lot of research into the book when it gets banned. Yeah. When it gets voted on. Actually, no. so yeah, looking it up right now, um, challenges have included complaints about profanity, morbid, and depressing themes. <laughs> oh, heaven forbid you have to face that. We don't have those. Yeah. Heaven forbid. Yeah, you have to process emotion. Uh, the author's <laughs> alleged anti-business attitude. So okay, yeah, you were right. Wow, you did give them enough credit. <laughs> wow, I really Yay. downplayed everyone. Gosh. Uh, others have. Oh yeah, I can't them. criticize the boss. Can't yeah. criticize the <laughs> dynamics on the ranch. Yep. Yeah. The anti-business attitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so absurd. Okay, go on. <laughs> uh, derogatory towards African Americans, women, and the developmentally disabled. <laughs> You are right. Which I, yep. which it should be, because that's his point to me. I mean, yes, you should be offended mm-hmm. by that because he's shining a light on it and he's pointing out like how how things were. And yeah, yeah we should be yeah. offended by that. We should be upset yeah. by it. Yeah. yeah, but you don't get don't shoot the messenger. Yeah. <laughs> no. Well, I think that also I'm a, I. A, professionally I'm a journalist and something I think about a lot and I write long form is that um a lot of this writing um especially 1930s to the 1960s was so much like just long form journalism like a lot of the fiction writing because it was reflecting what was happening in society and it didn't necessarily end with like a moral like tie-in it was just saying this is what the world is that we're looking at and this is yeah this is our world this is our society at this time and um and it did a lot of good like the book like the jungle that was fiction and it's similar to this where there's a lot of stereotyping there's a lot of yada yada yadas but it was so instrumental in changing people's perspective of workers rights Mm -hmm. and i feel like and i i don't know if this this is something i should look up and i'll probably add it in later is that um i believe did grapes of wrath have an impact on the government um the New Deal stuff with the Dust Bowl people. Because um, I believe that there was a relationship between the Grapes of Wrath and funding that went into um, migrant camps in California. Because um, what's-her-face... Oh, gosh, this is so embarrassing. Photographer who may or may not have gotten consent for migrant mother. Dorothy. Dorothy Lang. Oh, yeah, okay. Dorothy Lang. Lang, Lang yeah. Because she was involved in this, too. And I believe like there was, like... She and I, I, I'm like 98% sure. I'm going to look it up and get the link and everything. But that Steinbeck's work did have an impact on funding and different projects that were moved into migrant um, camps because of Grapes of Wrath. So, so like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot of like a lot of those stereotypes and things like that. But but it's not I don't know. I just think it, he was telling the truth. He was telling what was happening in using fiction to help us to make it palatable but um yeah that's i didn't have a good tie-in for that i mean (laughs) end scene yes (laughs) (laughs) but yeah i don't know i don't have any other things do you have anything to add eden and christy nothing else Um, besides that it's been a delight but yeah yeah, go ahead christy (laughs) yeah go i was just gonna say that you know i think when we look at banning books there's some mm-hmm. different things we have to look at. Um, there is a difference in our conversations depending on the context of the situation. Mm-hmm. There's a difference between um, what we put in an elementary school library for kids to yes. access versus middle and high school. There's a difference between what's available at a public library versus a high school library even. Mm-hmm. You know, high school students are going into college. I teach a college level class. They need access to college level texts. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also a difference in conversation about books that are taught whole class versus ones that are taught as choice books. Kids pick and Mm -hmm. they read independently. Whole class, I firmly believe needs to be books that are complex that kids need teachers to help them process through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I think right now we're having a bit of a pendulum switch, you know, shift with well-intentioned people sometimes picking books also that, they throw away ones like this to replace it with something else that they think is more accessible for kids. Um, and it's often not to that caliber. Um, mm. So that's one of my worries as well is that. Do you have an example teach- of that? Um, I'll give you a different example okay. at my school. Um, we're trying to diversify the text, which texts we offer, which I'm totally in support of. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the big thing is what are we replacing with and why and what does that look like? And so at my school for ninth grade, they used to read To Kill a Mockingbird as one of the big whole class texts. And you guys talked about that one? Not, Not yet. 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 Oh, well, you we better put it on your list. Uh, <laughs> so that has been replaced with The Hate You Give. Mm. And The Hate You Give is a beautiful book. It's a great young adult novel. Mm-hmm. I totally push that one on my kids for independent reading. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I don't teach ninth graders. But I can't see using that because it's in the literary analysis unit, mm. which is all about looking at themes and style and mm-hmm. structure and complexities. And so for me, it's like, as a whole class read, I just don't see it with that one. It's a mm-hmm. great book for me to give for kids in book clubs or independent reading when I say, hey, now yeah. apply this yourself without my help. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's something we have to be cautious of and saying, you know, what are we replacing with? Um, what rubrics are we using to make those decisions? Hmm. Yeah, and that makes sense. Thinking of our communities as well and involving them in that process. Um, but, you know, this one, um, you know, I've had, it got replaced as well, so it's no longer being taught at my school because we had a big um, curriculum shift um, in trying to have a lens of social justice throughout our 6 through 12 English curriculum. And so the rubric they used really eliminated all of our books by white writers. And so when you say the pendulum swing, it's like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's getting rid of everything to bring in totally new. And I see both sides of it. And it's like, yeah. where's the place in the middle where it's like, yeah. well, some we can keep and some we can replace, but it's gone the other way. And I think it will swing back. And it's just a process of working through the text and seeing you know, change is hard for everybody. So of course you're going to get pushed back on any change for teachers. <laughs> we like yeah. to be comfortable with what we've done. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's been challenging because of mice and men has been replaced and it's one that I just love to teach. And, um, but the other book is a great book in the time of the butterflies. Um, it's, it's, I think, even harder for kids to understand, but <laughs> that's a different story for a different day. <laughs> I love that. You guys are getting more challenging. (laughs) Yeah, but it's stylistically lovely, but yeah. So those are issues that teachers deal with, pressure from lots of sides. We want to to find things that kids can, like, actually appreciate, find Mm -hmm. connections to. Yeah. And so we feel like we're pulled a million different directions. We have politically what's happening. We have school boards telling us what to do, curriculum directors dictating you must do this or you – if you're going to do a whole class book, you must teach this book. Otherwise, you have to do something else. And there's parents that will complain. We've had parents that won't let kids read or even hear kids talk about Macbeth because there's witches in it. Whoa. So, I mean, I think a lot of people in the public aren't aware of these arguments that were given. And um, yeah, you have these extremes on so many sides. Yeah. And you're never going to make everyone happy. That's yeah. my issue. I always tell people is in every book you find, there's going to be something somebody probably objects to. And if there's not, it's probably a really boring book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, there's, yeah. There's a great thing at the end of Fahrenheit 451. It's the last thing I'll say, I promise. Um, there's the coda at mind. the end Keep the going. end of Fahrenheit 451. It's like an essay Ray Bradbury wrote. And he was responding to people that were trying to ban his books from school libraries and from schools. And he talks in there about all these different interest groups and the, this religion and this religion, these people complaining, these people complaining. If they want to write their, if they want it, then write your own books. <laughs> and, <he talks laughs> of, and then he also, you know, brings up that what's going to happen is, and this is the metaphor I really love, is that you're going to be left with vanilla pudding. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's yeah. what you're going to have left behind if we yeah. censor so much and make everybody happy is, yeah. is and who wants who wants vanilla pudding? Yeah. Yeah. Let's do a plug for the books you've written though. So sure. tell us about that trilogy and then we'll let you go. All and right. Short so and if you can send us links to the anthologies if they're public if we can if we have access to them. I'll I would see if love they're still getting those. Yeah. I'll see if they're still getting published. Those were published by the Log Cabin Literary Center in Boise, Idaho. Um, they're cool. kind of an advocacy group for writers and they were judged by a panel including the Idaho Commission for the Arts 
um, one person from that that's in, with writing and literature. Cool. Um, so they have that program. Um, my trilogy is the Keening Trilogy, and the first book is She's Call, and it's spelled S-I-D-H-E apostrophe S, um, because that's the Celtic spelling for the fairy mm. folk. Um, oh and my story is a contemporary fantasy, so it takes place not today, but within, you know, since Nintendos are around, so what we're talking, when it was a Game Boy really big, that's the era you're talking about, the yeah. 80s, probably mm-hmm. late 80s, early 90s, no, probably more like the 90s. Um, so the main character, there's two main characters really, so it's a dual narrative. Um, one is, um, a banshee named Morgan and she is 16 and she is coming of age to where she has to start playing her role as a banshee, which they're in Idaho, um, (laughs) followed immigrants from, um, the British Isles over Uh as part of their tradition and beliefs and banshees help sing people to their deaths. Um, So I borrowed it from Celtic mythology. Um, So when a person's going to die, the first night, um, the banshee will scream. And for my banshees, their eyes turn blood red and the blood drips down their face (laughs) as they're screaming. (laughs) And um, no one sees them, but they hear it, the wailing, and everybody in the town hears it. The second night, only the person in the house who's going to die hears it. So the whole family Mm. hears everybody living in that house. And then the night before the person's going to die, just the person who's going to die hears the banshee scream. So she's supposed to have her first person she is singing to their death. Mm. And he is a 15-year-old boy named Aiden. And he's just a typical Game Boy playing boy um, (laughs) who is traveling with his parents um, and moving in Idaho from Utah. And... um, yeah, he has his own issues with his family, and then he event- they eventually meet up, and there's some drama with the fairy world and maybe a gateway that <sighs> needs to be dealt with between the worlds. And so, yeah, the series is a little bit different. Each book has a different feel. The first one is more of their story, the two of them. The second one is a little bit more Morgan. She's my main protagonist that mm-hmm. goes through the whole series. Second book is more of a serial killer, murder mystery thing that she's trying to deal with and help yeah. kind of figure out. Um, and then the third one ties it all together, of course. So it's... Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. This is so, excited. Yeah, send us the link. I want to add it and oh. I want to buy it too. Buy yeah. the books. I want to read them. Do it. Put it back up on the sellers list. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's been a while since I published them and they were... Um, I submitted it to Amazon's Breakthrough Novel Award that they used yeah. to do. And placed in the top 50 out of 5,000 entries, oh which was pretty big. Gosh, I was like, yeah. yeah. And I got a review from Publishers Weekly that came along with that. If you placed in the top 50, they had one of their reviewers actually write a nice review blurb. Yeah. So that was a good experience. Um, still trying to get, like, eventually maybe have an agent represent me for writing. Yeah. And yeah. we'll see. I'm currently working on an adult fantasy right now that's kind so of a dystopian cool. fantasy. So. Ooh. Um, we'll see how that goes. Oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, I'm too. so excited. Especially the Idaho thing is fun. Yeah, we uh, thank you so much, Christy, for joining us. We're super excited that we had this opportunity to, to chat with you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> We're going to cut this in somehow. Yeah, it's going to be <laughs> seamless. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Christy. Um, you're always invited back. We will even show you what books we're going to do in the future if you ever want to come back on. If you never want to come back on, that's also okay. That's, that's yeah, okay, we too. Will, <laughs> we will not be offended. No, thank you for having me, but appreciate it. It's so cool. And I look forward to seeing all your other books you reviewed. Oh my gosh, yeah. we are too. Yeah. Um, and then we don't know what we're going to read next, so don't get excited about that. Yeah, Listeners we don't know that in yet. Macau. <laughs> and then anything else thank you, you Macau. Need to say? Uh, that's it. That's it. Yep. Thank you. It's just a yeah. We just needed a way to naturally end that. End that. And, and you did. You made it very natural. Yeah. <laughs> 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 did I? Burn this book is produced by us, Nicola Corin and Eden Wen. Music written by me, Nicola Corin, and produced and performed by my dad, Frank. <laughs>